you for watching today. I pray that the message you're about to hear will empower you to use your voice, help change the way you think, and refresh your spirit. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, you can find them on the on-demand page of walkingbyfaith.tv or on our app. Today, we're celebrating Pentecost. Even though Jesus was the Son of God, He came as an empty vessel, a normal man just like us. But He used the Holy Spirit to perform miracles. Then Jesus went away so that the Helper would come to all of us so that we could perform the same works and even greater miracles when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Come with me right now as we join Pastor in the Helper. And I'm gonna be sharing on Pentecost today, but I wanted to start out back in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They are tempted by the devil. They fall into sin. And somebody said that, that what actually happened was that Eve ate them out of house and home. What do you think about that? Because I mean, they, they ended up getting kicked out. And, and, and God puts some cherub angels at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. And they're holding these flaming swords so that they do not go back in and eat of the tree of life and live forever in their fallen condition. Well, you come up into the New Testament you have the resurrection of Jesus, and a lot of great things are a result. But one of the things that happened is that in the temple, where the holiest of holy of holies was, there was this huge veil. Now, God's presence is inside that, that holy of holies. And uh, there's only one thing that's there. It's the Ark of the Covenant, which really speaks to us about God needs to be the center of our life. There's just one thing that's really really can be the center. And one thing that really fulfills us, it's that relationship with God. But there is a veil. They say that it was 20 feet tall and up to six inches thick. And on that veil are cherub angels. But when Jesus arose from the dead, that veil is ripped in two. And it's telling us that the presence of God is no longer something that is far away from us that a relationship with God is no longer far away from us. We can come right into God's presence. And really, that's when we, we look at Easter, the resurrection, that's what it's about, our relationship with God. But then we come to Pentecost. Now, um, in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost has, has come and the Holy Spirit falls like a rushing, mighty wind. And the Bible tells us that there are people there, I believe it's 14 different ethnicities are there as the Holy Spirit falls and people are getting saved and there's, there's tongues of fire. But what really happens that day is the wall of ethnic, ethnic, how can we say this, separation is to be literally melted away by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all of those ethnicities that are there, the Holy Spirit falls and they all become of one mind and one heart. And, and that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does. He makes us one. Well, as Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter two, he says, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, by the way, the last days began on the day of Pentecost. But if it was the last days 2,000 years ago, how many of you know we are in the last of the last days? All right. That I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, says God. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. You know, what God says is going to happen in the last days is that there is going to be a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. And there's going to be manifestations in our lives as a result of the Spirit of God moving in our lives. In John 16, in verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. He's been physically with them for three and a half years. 
He's talked with them. He's been their companion, their friend, their coach, their mentor, their teacher, a provider, an example. And he's saying, look, it is going to be better for you that I'm gone. Because when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit is going to come. In John 6, 14, verse 26, it says, but the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit. He's, he's saying the Holy Spirit is going to come. In fact, one translation says to represent me and act in my behalf. A lot of people really are afraid of the Holy Spirit. And I think that, that some of us are afraid of the Holy Spirit because we've seen weird people. But the Holy Spirit's not weird, but people can be weird. And they blame the Holy Spirit for their weirdness because the Holy Spirit is like Jesus. He said another comfort, and it's another of the same kind. He said he's similar. He's not different. In John 5 and verse 19, it says, we know positively that we are of God and the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. The world around us needs to receive Jesus, but the church needs to receive the Holy Spirit. We need to receive. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist, Jesus' forerunner, his approach by the religious people from Jerusalem. And they said, basically, who are you and what are you doing? He said, I indeed baptize with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandal I'm not worthy to carry. He, that's Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He, Jesus, will baptize you. All believers, listen, receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. In fact, in Romans 8 and 9, it says, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But there is more that Jesus wants to do. And notice, he is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think, wow, if I could have just been around when Jesus was walking around the Sea of Galilee or if, when he was in Jerusalem or when he was doing miracles or multiplying the loaves and the fishes, and we want to be a part of his past ministry, neglecting his present day ministry. The Bible says that he is the high priest of your confession, part of his ministry today. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us. And the Bible says that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. That's part of his present day ministry. Now, why should we think that we would have enjoyed his ministry then but we don't want his ministry now. Uh, Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he came to his disciples in John chapter 20. And he came up to him and he's talking to him and he said to them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them. <sighs> receive the Holy Spirit. How many think they received? I don't really think there's any question that they received. But yet a short time later, he's with his disciples. And this is recorded in Acts chapter 1. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you said you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they've already received the Holy Spirit, but he says, you should not leave the city limits without the Holy Spirit. This was important. Jesus knew that they had the Spirit, but he said, there's something more. And it is so important. This is something I want for you. And by the way, there's different terms that are used in the New Testament. It's the baptism in the Holy Spirit is called the promise of the Father. It's called being poured out. It's talked about being... The Holy Spirit fell upon them. It, it talks about their being filled. You know, it talks about being baptized or immersed, poured out, being lavished upon. The Holy Spirit is given. He's presently, freely available. Now, it is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Some people say it and they say the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's incorrect. 
If it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it would be the Holy Spirit doing the baptizing. But it's the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the one doing the baptizing. It's not strange or impersonal. It's Jesus, the one who's coming as the one who baptizes. It's not to be feared, but it is a distinct event from salvation. In Acts chapter 1, it says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom? Now, Jesus has just said you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they get off focus. They're still thinking about the kingdom. Now, let me just, just move aside here for just a moment. Because Jesus did not come so you could be forgiven and go to heaven. Jesus came to bring a kingdom. That's why he came. And that kingdom does not begin when you die. It begins instantly. When you receive Jesus, you are a part of that kingdom. In fact, his message was repent for the kingdom of God is here. And now, so the disciples are like, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, remember when Jesus comes back, he's going to rule and reign from, for a thousand years from Jerusalem. That will be the beginning of the enforcing of the kingdom. Now, in various places, but it's particularly in Daniel chapter 2, it talks about that kingdom. It will never end. It will never be left to another people. So, so they're thinking this is the time when the kingdom's coming. And, and Jesus said, hold it. You're, you're, you're missing. You're missing something. There's going to be a church age. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power. The Greek word is dunamis. We get our word dynamite from this word. When the Holy Spirit is come upon you, talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. Now, there is something that is external about when the Holy Spirit comes, because there's going to be power. You're going to be a witness. But there is also an internal work that takes place as the Holy Spirit is poured out, as we are baptized in that Holy Spirit. It's interesting on the day of Pentecost that there appeared cloven tongues as a fire. And that wasn't just a sign, because not only is there a power for something external, but the Holy Spirit comes to purify. He comes to bring holiness. In Acts chapter 2, we find the day of Pentecost come in the first verse. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. They were, it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they were all, oh, excuse me. And there appeared unto them diverse tongues as a fire that set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, when, when theologians read this, read this they, they come up with three, three very, I think, important questions. And first question is, is this the only time this ever happened? Secondly, is it a separate event from salvation? And thirdly, does it happen simultaneously at salvation? I think the first, the, the first one I mentioned, is this something that happened once and only once? We can answer very quickly from Acts chapter 10, is Peter is at the house of a Roman centurion named Cornelius. He's preaching. And the Bible says that while he's speaking the words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard. And those of the circumcision, the Jews, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speaking with tongues and magnifying God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Not that just as we have. He, what he's saying is this. He's saying the Holy Spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost, here it is a decade later, and now again, they are receiving the Holy Spirit just as we have. So was it a one-time event? Absolutely not. Second question. Is it instantaneous or spontaneously happen at conversion? Let me just say yes and no. Most of the time it doesn't. There's five examples given in the book of Acts 
And in one example only were, was the baptism in the Holy Spirit and conversion at the same time. And we just read it right here. It's at Cornelius's house. But in every other instance, it was subsequent to salvation. In Acts 2, as Peter finishes his sermon, the people said, what must we do? He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say something here. The gift. It's not something we earn. It's not like we suffer so much, give so much, pray so much, get a certain amount holy. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like the gift of salvation. I, I know some people, they, they want to get right with God, and they think, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean myself up, and then I'm going to come to God. How many know he cleans his own fish? Amen. You don't get cleaned up and then come to God. You come to God as you are, and God cleans you up. He works from the inside, right? So he said, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, to your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord your God shall call. Now notice the promises to you and to your children and to those that are a far off. 2,000 years ago, we were afar off. That promise is for us today. But it's for people who not only want the person of Jesus made real in their life by the Holy Spirit, but also want the power of Jesus to work through them by the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Jesus told his disciples, don't even leave the city limits without the Holy Spirit. It's something Jesus wants for you and for me. It's something that empowered Jesus in his ministry. Uh, it, if, if you study the ministry of Jesus, what you find is this. All the miracles Jesus did, he didn't do because he was the son of God. Was he the son of God? Yes. But in Philippians 2, the Bible says he took aside and he laid aside all of his power all of his innate deity. And Jesus ministered as a man. He said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives. The things Jesus did, he did as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, he could have never said to you and me, the works that I do will you do also, and even greater works. If he did those things because he was God, we wouldn't have a chance. But he didn't do them because he was God. He did them as a man, anointed of the Holy Spirit. So Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good, doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So on the day of Pentecost, we had the tongues of fire that were present. That was just that day. But it represents the truth that the Holy Spirit is not just about power. He's about purity. He is about holiness. And Jesus said, excuse me, Jesus said, Peter in his sermon gives, gives us really three things that we are to do. He says, repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say this. That is the pattern. The pattern is to repent, to be baptized, and to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes to the Jordan River, is baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit descends. In Exodus, the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. The, 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 the Pharaoh and his army are, are following after. They come to the Red Sea. Moses extends his rod. God opens the sea. And the Bible says the children of Israel pass through the sea all night long. Now, you remember what, it, what, what happened at night? There was a pillar of cloud at day, but it was a pillar of fire at night. 1 Corinthians 10 says they were all baptized under Moses in the sea and under the cloud. The sea represents water baptism. The cloud of fire represents spirit baptism. And notice it says they were all baptized unto Moses. The pattern is, Baptized, 
in water after you repent and then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice again, Peter said, the promise is for you. In Acts 19, we find a great example. It says, and it came to pass in the first verse that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and find some disciples. He said to them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? When you believed, you received. It was automatic. But there is more that Jesus wants. Jesus wants to immerse you, to baptize you, to pour out the Holy Spirit upon you. And they said to him, well, we have not so much as there if heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I remember reading that early on as a Christian, and I thought, well, maybe they went to my church. <laughs> because we didn't know, we never talked about the Holy Spirit. Now, we did know about him a little bit because we repeated the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. And in the Apostles' Creed, it mentioned the Holy Spirit. But literally, that was all I knew about the Holy Spirit, that you know that he's alive because he's mentioned in the Apostles' Creed. So he said to them, how were you baptized? They said, we don't know about the Holy Spirit. He said, well, how were you baptized? Because how many of you know when you get baptized, you ought to at least know the Holy Spirit exists? Because you're going to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he said, well, didn't you even hear about him when you were baptized? And they said, well, we were just baptized according to the baptism that John had. And he said, well, John said to believe on the one who's coming after. That's on Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. L literally, it is Pentecost revisited. It's almost 20 years after the resurrection. And yet it's Pentecost all over again. And notice they're baptized. Then Paul laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. His question was, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Because when you believe, you receive. In fact, it says in Romans 8 and 9 that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Another great example of this is, full, is it found in Acts chapter 8. When Philip, who's one of the first deacons, goes to the city of Samaria, and he says he preached to them, and the multitude with one accord, heeding the things spoken, is spoken by Philip, hearing, seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came into many who were possessed, many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. There was great joy in the city. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the thing concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. Now, Jesus said this so clear in Mark chapter 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. It says they believed and they were baptized. Now, look at verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any or none of them. Now, they believed they were baptized in water, but the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon them. And this was a concern to the apostles in Jerusalem. When they heard these guys have believed and are baptized, but, but they have not received the Holy Spirit, since they believed, they sent Peter and John to go down and pray for them. And when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't automatic. They believed, bam, baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, it was later, just like in Ephesus, just like with the Apostle Paul. Now, that is the normal pattern that we find. That first you're saved, then later you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Most of the time, after a person has been baptized in water. Now, what happens when somebody receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, normally, there is a deeper compassion for lost people, a greater readiness to serve, a heightened hunger for spiritual pursuit, a greater belief in the spiritual realm or the supernatural, 
and power to witness. Power to witness. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, it, it, it says this. It says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In, uh, in the Greek, it's a continuous tense. So it's, it's literally saying, be being filled. Be being filled. Not, not this one time. You say, yeah, but I received, the, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but you leak. You know what I'm saying? That? You leak. All right? And so it, it's like, be being filled. All right? This morning, I, I, I prayed again, and I said, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we do just one time. It is something that we should be seeking again and again and again and again. Now, on the day of Pentecost, it says they all, that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want to take about five minutes to kind of finish this up. Now, notice that it says they began to speak. Many people think the Holy Spirit speaks in tongues. They're waiting for God to speak. But God does not speak in tongues. You do. It says they began to speak. See, whenever there's something supernatural, there's a human side and a supernatural side, a God side. Peter's in the boat. Jesus said, come. Peter gets out and starts to walk. Now, you say, wow, Peter did a miracle. Not really. I don't know about you, but I walk every day. Peter did something natural. God got underneath so he wouldn't sink. That was supernatural. God says, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Listen, you could not heal a mosquito. Not that you'd want to, but, but if, you, well, if you did. All right? You see, you lay hands. That's natural. God heals. That's supernatural. See, and it's the same. It's the same. So, see, sometimes people are waiting for God to supernaturally speak in tongues. He does not. You begin to speak, and he gives you utterance. So sometimes people are waiting for God to take over. Now, let me just give you a few verses uh, about this. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, Paul said, I wish you all spoke with tongues. The uh, 18th verse, he said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. He was from Texas. He said, y'all. But he says, I speak with tongues more than you all. And, and, and realize, he's talking to the Corinthians, and uh, they were speaking in tongues a whole lot. It says in the uh, second verse, 14th chapter, he said, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Now, when you talk to God, what do we call that? Prayer. It's simply saying, if a person is speaking in tongues, they're talking to God. They're praying. It's their spirit praying. And notice it says no one understands him. Howbeit in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Somebody says, well, I, I listen. It sounds like a bunch of gibberish to me. Well, I quit eavesdropping. They're not talking to you. Who are they talking to? They're talking to God. How many of you know that's always a good thing to talk to God? But whenever someone is speaking in tongues, they're talking to God. In the 14th verse, it says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. But my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps no one. So if a person is praying in tongues, your spirit is praying with the help of the Holy Spirit. And it says your brain, your mind is unproductive. Your, your mind is out of the picture. Now, I don't know if you know this, but almost all your problems are in between your ears. And so like what the Lord does, is he says, look, we're going to do a Holy Ghost bypass operation. We know you got all these problems. So let's just get this thing out of the way. And let's just let the Holy Spirit in your spirit pray directly to God. Now, here's one of the great things. When this happens, number one, there's no selfish prayers. You never pray like, Lord, bless me, my wife, our son, his wife, us four. No more. Ask two four. I mean, you, there's no selfish prayer, all right? And then the other great thing is, and it says this in Romans chapter 8, it says that you always pray according to the will of God. Because it's not your brain thinking what to pray. It's the Holy Spirit moving in your spirit. You see, so often we see somebody and we're like, man, something's not right. I wish I could pray for them. Say, Lord, bless them. Lord, help them. That's good. But how many know the Holy Spirit can do a lot better than that? He can get right down to the very situation. So the, uh, one more thought. Jude verse 20 says, but you, beloved, 
building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So what's this saying? It's saying that when you're praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Spirit, it says you're building yourself up. You're edifying yourself. It says in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, we're in an edifice. We're in something that's been built up. Um, the, 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 the New Testament was originally written in Koine Greek, which t- today is actually a dead language. No one speaks it. But they said it would actually, the word edify here in the Greek, we would use today to, char- to say to charge a battery. Most of us have probably gone out some morning in the winter and stuck the key in the ignition and turned it, and it went tick, 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 tick. How many, how many have had that terrible, terrible sound? Okay. So what you need to do then is you need to get a jump. You need to get somebody who's got a good battery in their car, run the cables over, and they begin to rev their motor, and the energy in their battery flows over into your battery, and you charge or edify your battery. And what the Bible is saying is that when you speak in tongues, you're talking to God, but it edifies, it builds up, it charges your spiritual battery. Somebody says, well, that sure sounds selfish to me. If you need $10 and I'm broke, I can't help. If you're spiritually broke and somebody needs help, you can't help. But if you're charged up and they need help, you can, you can be of benefit to that person. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus is talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. He says, if you ask, well, he says, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be open. Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. He who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks of bread of any of you fathers, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? To those who ask him. The Bible is saying when we ask, we're not going to receive something other than what we ask for. Our, he- our earthly fathers are good, but our heavenly father, he is perfect. And the Holy Spirit is something that we need to ask for. And I want to ask right now for everybody to, to bow your head and wherever you're at online. If, if you have never received the Holy Spirit, we're going to have posted here a prayer that you can pray. But I want to pray for you right now. And father, we, we recognize that you said the Holy Spirit is a good gift. And that is your will for us to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that everyone that asks will receive. And Father, we ask now that the Lord Jesus would fill each one with the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord, until our cup overflows. Ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to thank you for being with us today. And you know, the Bible says this. It says, we've written these things to you that you may know that you have everlasting life. So many people, they believe in God. They believe Jesus arose from the dead, but they don't know that they have everlasting life. If you're not sure you're forgiven right with God on your way to heaven, you're not where you should be with God. Now, in Romans 10, the Bible says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And right before it, it gives us really the way to call on the name of the Lord. It says that if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want to lead you right now in a prayer to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. If you're away from God, you're not right with God, you don't know where you stand with God, this is for you. So I'm going to invite you, pray this prayer. I want you to repeat these words out loud from your heart. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins and I believe he rose again. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. Jesus is my King. Jesus is my Lord. I'm gonna live for him. And I thank you, you've heard my prayer that I'm forgiven, a part of your family today and forever. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, God heard that prayer and you were right with God. You're on your way to heaven. Now, I wrote a book to help you keep on growing spiritually. All the information is right there on your screen. You can download that book for free. Or if you need a hard copy, contact us and we'll send it to you free of charge. Thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We pray for you. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so excited for you. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and have it mailed to you. Download it right there instantly, or you can find it on our app. It's absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. We believe that when you confess God's word over your life daily and you begin to meditate on it, it will change your life. Check out the confession section of the Walking by Faith app on the home screen. You can also listen to all past sermons, submit a prayer request, check out the weekly devotional, and so much more. Look for it in your favorite app store today. Walking by Faith is reaching the world with the truth of God's word on and off the air. If this ministry is blessing you and feeding you spiritually, please consider becoming a partner by going to walkingbyfaith.tv slash give. Find us on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and on your favorite social platform by searching WBF TV. I pray you have a wonderful and blessed week, and we'll see you next time.